Let's go live, okay? Let's go. And we are live. So, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. So, today is Rewilding Day, World Rewilding Day. And if you go onto Wikipedia, you will read that rewilding is a form of conservation of ecosystems that aims at restoring biodiversity with an emphasis on recreating an area's natural and cultivated state. Rewilding is also a way to mitigate global climate change and is one of the pillars of replanning. And to speak about rewilding, our guest today is Professor Herman Orizaola, a senior researcher of the Ramon y Cajal program at the Zoology Unit in the Department of Biology of Organisms and Systems at the University of Oviedo, Spain. He is also a senior researcher at the Instituto Mixto de Investigación en Biodiversidad the Biodiversity Research Institute, IMIR, which is a joint center between the University of Oviedo, the Spanish Research Council, and, of the, and the Principality of Asturias, Spain. So the professor is an evolutionary ecologist interested in understanding how organisms respond to environmental stresses. For the audience, you probably already have come across some of the professor's work, but you still don't realize it. More of that in a moment. Professor. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation today. Uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, as I understand, you've been studying the Chernobyl exclusion zone for quite some time. Can you tell us for how long? Since uh, 2016. So it's, it's going to be seven years now. The, wow. Even starting in 2015, so developing some ideas, some plans or whatever. But first time... Uh, I went there uh, was was uh, seven years ago, yeah, and uh, yeah, keep keep on working on that, on that uh, same field. Even even though last year, sadly, we we are not being able to to visit the area, to visit Ukraine for all the madness happening over the last few years. No? But uh, yeah, it's it's quite has been quite a while. It's been quite a while. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Uh, the floor is yours, and. Okay. Uh, I'll, for the viewers, please, if you have any questions or comments, say it on the face on the YouTube uh, comment page, and uh, we will read the, the the best at the end of the talk. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank yours. you. Thank you. I, I share the full screen. So, um, <clears throat> as we said, we we are going to talk about Chernobyl and, and wildlife with this uh, framework of being today the the war rewilding day. Uh, yeah, we, we we all know about Chernobyl. We all know. Uh, what it is, or what happens, but I will try to to go through uh, another bit of context to, to, for the rest of the talk. No? We we know pretty well where Chernobyl is, and we know pretty well, a bit sadly, uh, the map of Ukraine right now because all the madness is happening there since the Russian invasion. No? But uh, Chernobyl is is more or less three thousand kilometers from Portugal and three thousand three hundred from Lisbon, and, and now we we are. Uh, here with uh, Replanet Portugal. So it's east of, of uh, Europe and, and pretty close to the border of Belarus. No? On that area is a bit of the mix in ecological terms of the, of the eastern steppe, but also still under the, the influence of the boreal forest and, and so on. It's a really interesting place in, in, ecological, in ecological terms. But, but of course, we know that we are talking here about Chernobyl but for, for what happens in the 80s over there. No? Chernobyl was the place of uh, what was called the Vladimir Ilyich Lenin uh, nuclear power plant. And this is part of the power plant, actually a, a quite uh, rare photo of the reactor three and four, three on the, on the right, four on the left, uh, before the accident. No? So everything happened on that kind of block on the on the left, that, that the kind of a square building on the left. And what happens is that during well, a test in, in uh, April 1986, 26 April 1986, everything went wrong. Uh, the design of a pretty unstable reactor, how it was handled, and everything uh, led to the to the explosion of the of, of the whole building. Uh, the core of the reactor were exposed to to, to the air, to the open air, and the fire that was generated by the uh, graphite bars that should be the moderators of the of the reactors made the whole thing even worse. And with all this smoke 
uh, kind of a big area was was contaminated by radioactive material. Uh, the, the, the important thing for us that we have been talking, we're going to be talking about uh, rewilding nature and, and how all this area has been transformed is that with the accident, uh, an area that is called uh, exclusion zone was created around the, the power plant. Initially, it's, it's, it was this kind of 30 kilometers around the nuclear power plant. With the time, this area has been uh, modified in many different ways. And uh, it, it includes both uh, a bit area in, in, in the north, in Belarus, and what is called the proper let's say, Chernobyl exclusion zone in the Ukrainian side. So altogether, it's a really, really big area. It's, it's about 4,500 square kilometers. So if we put it into the, for example, Portuguese context, it equals that area that is uh, wide around the Evora district. So it's, it's almost the entire Evora district. So rather big area, which is quite key in, in, in the, what we are be, gonna be talking about rewilding. So if we compare also to uh, nature protected areas in, in Portugal, so the largest one in Portugal is the Serra da Estrela uh, Natural Park. It is uh, four times smaller, so it's about 1,000 square kilometers. And even all protected areas in Portugal are just a bit larger altogether than what represents the Chernobyl exclusion zone, both in the Belarus and Ukrainian side. So it's 6,500 square kilometers for all protected areas in Portugal, with, uh, we compare with uh, 4,500 the whole exclusion zone. So it's really, really big. And that's that's quite important. And another thing that is quite important is that that area was kind of quite heavily occupied by people. So up to 305,000 uh, 305, people were evacuated from the area. So it was quite densely populated, not only because of the nuclear power plant, but also because it was heavily used as agricultural uh, fields, agricultural areas. So it was heavily uh, uh, occupied by, by humans and all the kind of activities from the industrial to the agricultural to forestry. So it was heavily occupied and all these people was, was evacuated after the accident, which, which creates this kind of photos that I think we almost recognize. You know, like all these big cities like here in the, in the picture, the Pripyat city, the, the main city of the whole area uh, has been abandoned and is kind of decaying and almost just falling apart and disappear into the forest. Now, this is actually the main square in Pripyat, the, the, the main area in the whole city with the building of the, of the kind of Soviet uh, Communist Party on the, on the background. So it's a really, really important place at that time. But now, it's, as I said, it's almost uh, disappearing into, into the forest. No? And the same with one of the very iconic uh, images of, of, of Chernobyl, of Pripyat, the, the recreation park, the ferry wheels, all these uh, uh, areas that were not even not even open at the time of the accident and had been kind of the symbols of how uh, humans left the area. No? But uh, with all together, it was kind of the, the impact of the accident on the, on the humans is quite well represented by Pripyat and what happens there. The impact of the accident in, in nature that is uh, kind of the key point here was also important, especially important in some areas. This photo is, is from 1986, kind of low quality, but it shows a really important place is the Red Forest. Is, is that area is quite clearly one is called Red Forest because uh, the, all those uh, pine trees uh, actually were exposed to really, really high radiation levels. Uh, almost all, all trees died. All, all the kind of uh, needles become red and, and the whole thing kind of was transformed in a matter of a couple of days. No? This is, as I said, the, the big example of the uh, ecological impact of the accident uh, right at the time of the accident. No? This area was particularly exposed. And you can see on the left side of the, of the picture, areas nearby didn't suffer this kind of transformation because they were exposed to way lower uh, radiation levels. It depends on the winds, how they were blowing, and how they move the, the kind of radiation uh, uh, elements. No? But it, this is the kind of the, the big example. No? And at, at that time, and still quite often, you, you 
can hear that uh, the big idea is that Chernobyl will be transforming a nuclear wasteland. So in an area with no life, uh, all like, like this red forest kind of destroy, transform, and empty, empty of life. No? I, I always compare when, when, when you hear people talking about Chernobyl, it, it looks like one of those Martian landscapes no? that you, we can see now with the robbers, They're empty, no life or almost no life or yeah, all, all kind, of, uh, kind of pretty, pretty kind of post-apocalyptic. No? And actually at the time of the accident, and even now it's, it's quite often that you will hear this kind of sentence. Now this is taken from the TV series of four years ago, quite, quite successful from HBO. Uh, at that time, the, the, a lot of people say that Chernobyl will be empty of life for a lot of time, uh, even thousands of years. And this this number of 20,000 years, you can still can hear quite a lot. That Chernobyl will be an empty uh, wasteland uh, for 20,000 years. Well, uh, it, it's almost 37 years now since the accident. We are a month almost from the from the anniversary of the accident. And uh, the important thing is, is not just uh, remain when, with, with that idea of, of 1986. Uh, the, what we do is, is just go to Chernobyl and check if those predictions of empty uh, nuclear wasteland uh, hold or, or doesn't hold. No? <clears throat> so the, the big question is, how is Chernobyl now? How is the situation of nature in Chernobyl is still an exclusion zone that is uh, very limited uh, kind of human settlements and mostly uh, still connected with the nuclear power plant, the commission and control and so on. But how is the rest? How is the rest of those 4,500 kilometers? How is the situation of nature over there? Where would, uh, actually the place has been transformed incredibly. This is from United Nations Environment Program and uh, is already pretty well recognized that Chernobyl has become a heaven for wildlife. So just completely the opposite that it was expected and in many cases completely the opposite that you could still hear, Chernobyl has been transformed in a heaven for wildlife. And actually it's one of the uh, textbook examples of rewilding. This is taken from a paper published in, in Science uh, a few years ago, one of the top uh, scientific journals in the world. And Chernobyl was one of the, of the three, four examples of rewilding in the world. And actually uh, you could read over there that uh, Chernobyl uh, harbors now the entire portfolio of uh, European large carnivores, large herbivores, uh, rich mesopredator community and key ecosystem engineers such as the, the beaver. So it's already pretty well, uh, accepted as a rewilding uh, paradise in a way. No? So uh, let's, go, let's go and talk a bit about rewilding now that we are on the rewilding day. No? And uh, as I said, Chernobyl is a textbook that we could learn quite a few things uh, when we talk about rewilding. So rewilding can happen in, in different ways. It could be what I would call active rewilding or passive rewilding. Yeah? So active rewilding is when we do something, when we often uh, introduce or reintroduce uh, animals into, into a landscape, uh, kind of key ecosystem engineers that could transform some, some habitats to a more uh, kind of wild place or, or more kind of place in equilibrium, in ecological equilibrium. Here is a, a release of uh, bison in, in a different area, and I think it's is in the in the Czech Republic, in the Carpathians or, or Polis or area, I don't remember. So, but it's, it's kind of active, uh, so the humans acting uh, directly into the environment, as I said, or either, either modifying, uh, planting new species or releasing new species. No? It's the same in, in this photo, now with a Sewalski horse, that is gonna be one of the key species uh, in the talk, uh, kind of back to, the Mongolian steppe, no, it's, it's well, again, animals are being uh, bred in captivity, they are released into the habitat, and they, well, they, they, the idea is that they will um, recover some of the 
uh, ecological processes happening there and, and they were kind of transformed since they disappeared. This is, this is the active, as, as you will see, there's a lot of human activity, there's a lot of human intervention, it's always uh, uh, kind of costly, complicated and so. But, but the, the other thing is, is the passive rewilding and the passive rewilding can be easier. Uh, passive rewilding is don't do anything. Uh, and when you don't do anything, in the, some places are also extremely transformed. Uh, this is a case uh, in, in the Scottish mountains, uh, and you will see how an area was transformed almost in, in, in no time. So one photo is 2004, the other is 2020, 16 years in which the only thing that, that was done was removing the, many of the grazers in the area, the sheep and, and, and deers, and once you remove this, those uh, species that were uh, kind of creating this kind of uh, heavy ecological impact in you know, a bit more than a decade, that kind of area said overgraze with really low diversity of, of plants and animals transforms in this uh, uh, photo of the, of the right. It's a really nice forest, uh, meadows, uh, kind of a really nice river. Uh, the, the soil is retained, it's much richer, much uh, diverse. Yeah? So that, that, that's, that's a really important thing because also, as I said, with no human activity, it's, it's quite cheap to do this. Uh, and it's, as I said, it's quite effective. Actually, uh, this has been proposed as one of the best actions that we can do in many of our abandoned uh, farmlands and, and villages in Europe, because uh, when those areas are abandoned, because people can move to the cities or whatever, many of those places have become actually, uh, again, nature hot spots. And uh, well, this is an article, it is just choose one randomly that's actually linked this abandon of villages and areas with the comeback of many species, wolves and bears in particular. So as I said, this passive rewilding, uh, I think it's, it's really, really fascinating because it shows us how powerful nature uh, can recover if we let nature a bit of space, a bit of, of kind of, yeah, tranquility in a way. So back to Chernobyl, how is Chernobyl now? How is Chernobyl, how is this rewilding uh, happening in Chernobyl? Uh, I would show first how uh, the Chernobyl landscapes look like uh, now. No? As I said, almost four decades uh, after the accident. Yeah? Uh, first is the, is the nuclear facility. This is a photo I think I took in, in 2018, uh, already with the, uh, this building that is a, the safety building, the, the new confinement uh, for the reactor four. So it could be the commission with, uh, well, isolated from the environment, from, from the rain, from whatever happens. So this is the nuclear power plant. As you see, there's already quite a bit of trees growing around. So it's not that Martian uh, landscape that, that many people will tell you. you know? Apart from that, this is how Chernobyl looks like. Uh, this is a photo from one of the, uh, well, from the head of the uh, nature reserve in, in, in Chernobyl, Denis Wisniewski. Uh, and you can see how amazingly beautiful uh, the landscape uh, looks like. It's full of forest, also full of rivers. It's one of the last free flowing rivers in, the, in Europe, the river Pripyat that crosses the zone and creates all, all these patchwork of really rich environmental uh, areas with, with meadows and forests and, and uh, wetlands and so on. This is Chernobyl. So if you hear that Chernobyl is, is a really uh, bad place with no life or whatever, I think the idea you, you should have with Chernobyl is, is much more like, like this one, this photo is, 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 is really wild nature. Something that is happening in Chernobyl, and I think this photo and, 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 and the next one, and so pretty pretty easily, pretty clearly, is that big part of, the, of that area that used to be agricultural fields have been reclaimed by the forest. You can see that, that here there were three fields separated by those roads with, with forests in the background. And once those fields are abandoned, forests start to grow back and recover that place. And you will see these kind of mainly birches that are keep on growing on these all agricultural fields and transforming the area. 
Uh, actually, uh, this this area has, has been moving from a forest cover of about 40% to a forest cover of more than 70%. Uh, and, and also rich forests uh, is both deciduous, oaks and birch and whatever, and the kind of more uh, uh, forestal um, used the uh, Scots pines. <clears throat> but as I said, it has doubled almost the, the surface of the of the forest in the area since the accident. Now, once again, this is the, the, the thing that you, you could find when you move around in Chernobyl, how all those <clears throat> farmlands, you could still see kind of how, how they were cultivated, have been just starting to disappear into, into the forest that is kind of reclaiming back all those areas. Hmm? Another picture from there, you can see this beautiful mosaic of uh, meadows, forest areas, water, which is what actually looks like Chernobyl when you move around. So I said, it's 4,500 kilometers. The nuclear power plant is just a tiny, tiny, tiny place. Actually, the red forest is a tiny place. It's, it's less than 1% of the whole area. The rest of the area looks like this right now. A few examples of, of how this rewilding of the of the kind of more uh, plant side uh, or tree side looks like. This is a photo from just uh, west of Chernobyl city. It is in the corner uh, with uh, just be, just before the accident. All those area was really heavily farmed. There were all crops, kind of Soviet style, big big areas uh, of farms, and this is how it looks like now. You, you can see the big difference, how all those fields are disappearing, how trees started to grow, started to reclaim back all, all, the, all the surface. You can see if we just focus on that area, that particular area, how it's been changing from, I think it's uh, 1985 to the other photo that is uh, in, in uh, 2015, I think. How all those, all those areas between fields disappear, how trees started to grow from this uh, tiny corner, uh, close to the road and spread all over the fields. No? Another place, uh, actually, this place is supposed to be in, it was supposed to be, well, it still harbors kind of uh, high levels of radioactive uh, contamination. Uh, and this is how the area looked in, in 2002. So, still uh, quite a few years from the accident. And over the last years, this area, although the Virginia Lake has been transformed to this. So you can see the whole process is, 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 for me, this is the definition of rewilding. When you just left that area and nature just take control. So once again, if we focus on, on that spot on the, on the photo and we compare from 2002 to 2018, 16 years, and, and already yeah, just uh, quite many years since the accident, the first photo, you can see how the whole area has been transformed completely. And you could imagine from that semi, semi kind of dry environment uh, on early 2000 to this really rich green forested uh, landscape. How this has uh, modified all uh, sort of ecological parameters, how, how all this has modified all the animals that could occupy that area and so on. So, and um, well, this is a, a photo pretty close to, to, to the previous one. I wanted to show it, this one because you can see on the on the background uh, actually some of the buildings of the Pripyat city, and I'm pretty close. But out of the photo is is the nuclear power plant. Uh, this is uh, still an area and you could find really high radiation levels by the lake. We have been walking there uh, many many years, uh, but still this is how the area looks like, uh, at least in, it, in terms of the landscape, in terms of the trees that are growing over there and how it looks like. So once again, it's not at all the Martian landscape, but actually, at least for me, it's one of the nicest kind of forests and wild environments that we still have in Europe. Those are the landscapes. So then the, 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 the thing that I'm working more closely is with, with wildlife, with animals. And uh, <clears throat> once again, uh, when you have this kind of landscape that has been transformed and has been, uh, back to, to a wild place, uh, what you should expect is, is what happens. That is, this area is full of wildlife. 
So I'm going to show you a few of the keystone species that live in Chernobyl, the Eurasian lynx, actually how one of the uh, largest and, and, and more uh, densely populated uh, uh, kind of areas in Europe with up to 70 uh, lynxes have been uh, recently uh, published uh, that, that uh, occupy the area. So again, one of the big predators in, in, in northern and, and eastern uh, forest in Europe, quite quite uh, persecuted and, and, and quite uh, endangered in many places, but have a really, really big stronghold in, in the, the Chernobyl area. You can see here well, two just uh, crossing uh, in front of one of these camera, uh, automatic cameras in the middle of, of Chernobyl exclusion zone. Another really important species, uh, quite, quite singular, is the brown bear. This is another photo. This is, I think, is uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, the, 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 the important thing with brown birds is that they were not present in Chernobyl at the time of the accident. They were already extinct from the area or were hunted uh, and persecuted. And uh, the species were extinct from Chernobyl from, I think, uh, almost a century. So a few years, uh, less than 10 years ago, the first individual started to reappear in the zone. As again, completely natural uh, from all the areas from the north, from the, from the east. And uh, kind of, there are more and more present, a few individuals now, but moving around many different places of, of the Ukrainian side of the exclusion zone, uh, appearing on those uh, photo cameras uh, more and more often. We haven't seen yet a breeding record, so, so small, small birds, but definitely is one species that is back, and is back from a century of, of extinction. So this is one of the also key species showing how the area has been, has been rewilded. A quite similar species, the European bison. European bison is uh, also extremely uh, rare species. They were extinct in the wild, actually, uh, after the Second World War. Uh, and only after, well, some captive breeding and releases back in Poland, back in Belarus, uh, from Belarusian side of the exclusion zone where they were released, they have been reaching the Ukrainian side. Now, it's one of the large herbivores uh, with a very particular way of feeding, also able to transform landscapes in, in a very particular way. So also one of the key ecosystem engineers uh, that, that all that area uh, lost many, many centuries ago, and that is back uh, in the Chernobyl area. And with, with those species, uh, of course, you have the, the as, as, as I said before, the whole range of herbivores, uh, from roe deer, from red deer, and of course, uh, moose and elk, that I always said is, is one of the easiest species to spot, uh, I think for us, and normally walk there during the night with, with frogs, uh, it's almost, every single night that we cross uh, some of those uh, moons, uh, females with calves or whatever. No? This is one of the of the last photos uh, of, of this species before the invasion, the invasion, the Russian invasion. I think this is for February uh, last year. So again, uh, th this is a, a, another photo that I always wanted to show because you can hear from time to time uh, this idea of, okay, well, Chernobyl has no humans, and there are animals, but there are animals that came from outside and they are doing pretty poorly in Chernobyl and they die and they are replaced by other animals that came from outside. Well, that's wrong, that's not the case. And, and those photos, I mean, photos like this, they show that animals uh, live in Chernobyl, they breed in Chernobyl, they fulfill their life cycles inside Chernobyl with uh, no effects. Here is a, is a moose female with, uh, to, to young ones in, in an area in the middle of the exclusion zone. And, and there are records of, of breeding of every single species you could imagine, every single species, and so with you. Uh, and, and not only the mammals are living in Chernobyl, uh, of course, uh, all kinds of uh, birds also have occupied and reoccupied the area. And you have really big populations of black stork, for example, species that is also quite uh, endangered in many places in Europe, but it's, it's again uh, maintains a really uh, dense population in, in, in the Chernobyl uh, area and the Chernobyl exclusion zone, as 
many of the really important species that are suffering uh, big, big losses in other parts of Europe, like the corn crake. It's one of the most endangered species in, in, in the kind of meadow uh, environments, uh, meadows that are disappearing in many places in Europe, but that uh, still uh, are quite quite abundant in, in, in northern Ukraine in general, but uh, Chernobyl in particular. As I said, there are big programs trying to preserve these species uh, in, in many countries in Europe. In the, the Chernobyl exclusion zone, uh, the, the preservation of those uh, meadowlands uh, untouched by humans for many, many years now, they allow these species to uh, still breed over there and, and migrated, um, I think right now, uh, to the breeding places and, and doing relatively well. So this is another kind of key species uh, showing the, the, kind of the potential and the value of Chernobyl as a key uh, ecological uh, area. Of course, many of the big uh, raptors, especially all those raptors that are, uh, of course, not linked to humans, uh, are occupying the area. The white-tailed eagle uh, used to be almost absent uh, from Chernobyl before the accident was kind of heavily persecuted again. And since the accident is a, a regular breeder with a really nice breeding population, also regular during the winter time. Uh, and it's one of these species that is also quite easy to spot. And, and uh, well, every every year, such a big numbers spend the winter there and uh, are breeding now. We, we, we already have some photos from our colleagues from the last few weeks. Of, of the species breeding even by the cool by the cooling pond of the of the old nuclear facility. Another really interesting species is the Kepercheli. Kepercheli also quite endangered in many places in, in Europe, heavily endangered here in Spain. Uh, the, the, uh, was subject to introduction in, in the UK. Uh, it was really really scarce uh, in Chernobyl before the accident, almost not present at, at all. And with this advance of the of the forested area and the, with like, no hunting and no humans interference and so on, it's more and more common to find it in, in, in the Chernobyl forest, especially in the north part of the Ukrainian exclusion zone. Uh, so, these photos show, uh, they appear on the photos, they, they, you just find them when you are moving around. It's a species that is really, really in the rice, again, in, in, in Chernobyl exclusion zone. Uh, and, and yeah, as I said, no, I think there was, uh, yeah, up to 200 bird species have been recorded in, in the Chernobyl area. Many of the species endangered at the European level, endangered at the uh, Ukrainian uh, red list also. <clears throat> and with, as I said, populations that are mostly on the rise in the exclusion zone. All those were photos from the, the autumn and summer just before the, the war started. So they are pretty kind of recent photos big variety of species, as I said, many into the Ukrainian red list that have, once again, a really, really big stronghold in the Chernobyl area. Not only uh, kind of the vertebrates, although there are the group of, of animals that are being better studied in, in, the, in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, but also the area harbor, also a big uh, diversity of uh, insects and all, all kinds of animals. As I said, uh, probably we will need to, to study those uh, animals uh, much more in detail because there has been not that many effort to, to study insects and other invertebrates. But again, as you can see on, in this photo, uh, all these butterflies that really enjoy in all this meadowlands and so on. So now, now I'm going to focus on, on two particular species I have not mentioned. And there are examples in a way of these two ways of rewilding, the passive and the active. Right? Uh, one is the gray wolf. Grey wolf is, is for me the big examples of passive rewilding uh, in with respect to animals in, in Chernobyl. Wolves that, that were present in the area at the time of the accident, but there were really few uh, and really and really uh, kind of uh, yeah, in the corners and in the more remote areas of the exclusion zone. We know what is the history of of uh, wolves and humans, you know, and and still. When the wolves leave the exclusion zone, this is what happens with wolves. This is a, a report of a few years ago of uh, the Belarusian side of uh, as soon as the wolf left the area, they are heavily persecuted, they are heavily hunted. Uh, so this is still pretty kind of uh, 
conflictive uh, uh, area for the wolves. But that's an outside exclusion zone. Inside exclusion zone, wolves have taken control of many of the environments. There are the big predators in the area. So you can see in this photo, they're moving around, they're all villages that are moving around every single corner of the exclusion zone. And as I said, as the previous photo showed, there are actually that many, they started to, to move out of the exclusion zone, to leave the exclusion zone to other areas when they, again, they found some trouble. So this is where one, one the snapshot from the video from our colleague, also Ukrainian colleague, Sergei Gaschak. You can see a pack of, uh, I think it was up to 10 wolves in, in, in the video. You can see here, I think it's six wolves uh, with a carcass of, uh, of a deer, I think, uh, moose in, in, the, in the foreground. They're moving around. As I said, they are the big, big predator in, in, in the whole area. Né? Um, they occupy the, the, the entire exclusion zone, both the Belarusian side and, and the Ukrainian side. And uh, actually, you know, not, not just uh, any particular place. This is a photo of a wolf in the Red Forest. Uh, so the Red Forest, even though it's still a quite heavily contaminated place, uh, it doesn't mean that it's just empty of life. So wolves through the area, uh, moose use the area, many uh, kind of a species of vertebrates and birds are breeding there. So it's still an area which is quite particular because it's still pretty close to the nuclear power plant. Still a lot of noise, a lot of movement of humans around has been affected by several fires. But even though all those uh, kind of conditions, they still are, animals are, are using the area, using the, the, the red forest. So it's not, not even the red forest is an empty, uh, nuclear wasteland. So what, what the studies have shown is the uh, exclusion zone, the uh, Chernobyl exclusion zone uh, holds the highest density of walls in the entire Europe. And that's quite remarkable. I mean, when, when you think that this area uh, was supposed to be a, a wasteland for life, and uh, still you hear that kind of thing often, uh, just to realize that, that they hold the highest density of one of the big kind of charismatic animals in Europe as the wolf. Né? Actually, the density is seven times higher than other nature reserves uh, nearby. So it's, it's better, much, much better than the nature reserves uh, that are close by. And that's uh, mostly due because uh, what I said at the beginning, the area is really huge, it's really big. And what animals need is a space and a sort of calm environment with no big interference. And with those circumstances that happen in Chernobyl, especially like the wolves just flourish. And uh, yeah, is, is how you have, yeah, largely the highest density of, uh, as I said, such a charismatic animals as the wolves. <clears throat> uh, well, you can see also here another photo. It's also from the, from the red forest. As I said before, it's not just animals that are living there, are living full life cycles. This is a wolves just chasing a, a big moose. Uh, actually, he attacked it, and we, we saw in a previous photo uh, camera that they attacked this moose and is uh, chasing it. And uh, actually, I think he's hunted down the, this moose. So once again, animals living full life cycles in, in a really kind of uh, unique, unique place. <clears throat> Another unique species in the area, and, and uh, species have been uh, also starting to war with it before the war, is the Sevalsky horse. <clears throat> this is for me the example of, of the active rewilding in Chernobyl. Yeah? Even though it's, it's just one species uh, that have been released by humans in the area, it's, it's kind of the example of how also active rewilding happens. Uh, Sevalsky horses has, are just linked to this kind of really ancient uh, prehistoric animals that you, you can see on the caves now here in the Chauvet cave in, in, in France, this really uh, sturdy uh, kind of a small uh, animal with sword mane. Um, yeah, you can see the, this this on the on the first of those horses are really really like one of those Sewalski horses. Sadly, the Sewalski horses were also hunted to extinction in the world in the in the wild. And this is one of the last photos of one of the last hunting. Uh, trips 
to to the last place where they kind of resisted was uh, the steppes of uh, China, Mongolia, all that area uh, where the last animal was was uh, last seen in the in the kind of the 60s of, of the 20th century. As I said, species that uh, completely disappear, but uh, thanks to a few animals that were uh, in zoos, in the Berlin Zoo, in the Zoo of Prague, and, and so on, they were kind of breed together and exchange uh, animals from zoo to zoo, and they managed to recover the species. And uh, well, even in some places in Ukraine, like this uh, Ascania nova, uh, kind of reserve, uh, kind of breeding facility. Uh, the last of the of the wild horses that was collected in Mongolia is is where they the, they sent it, and it was one of the founders of the kind of a captive population that uh, remained in in Ascania nova for for many many years. And this is important because from Ascania nova, uh, quite a few years after the accident, is where uh, Sevalsky horses were sent to Chernobyl exclusion zone. So actually in 1998, 31 individuals, mostly from Scania Nova, were released in, in the exclusion zone. So it, this is uh, almost 10 years after the accident, radiation level were already much lower. And uh, it's not quite clear why they do this. Uh, what, what we know is that from these 31 individuals, uh, but they were kind of uh, released in a very rough way and quite many died almost on the spot, uh, were not used to, to the free life. And actually, what we can consider the, the founding population or, uh, is, is down to 23 individuals. As I said, uh, it looks like, it's not quite clear, but it looks like the idea uh, was kind of, uh, in a way, opposing to the rewilding of the area. The, the idea with the horses, uh, was to release the area in the, in the old farmland uh, environment uh, so they could just start browsing and start eating all the kind of new trees that were appearing, a bit like in the photo. So they could keep those areas uh, free of trees, open, just in case uh, at some moment they, they can be used again for, for farm uh, activities. No? So that, that, that was apparently the idea with the horses. Uh, of course, the horses, they, they, they did whatever they, they wanted. And this idea of controlling the trees uh, didn't work at all. Actually, the uh, horses are moving from the meadows to, to forest uh, constantly. And it's not unlikely to find those horses that are supposed to be step horses of the really grassy areas, like in the photo, just in the middle of the pine forest. They actually, it looks like they are pretty safe in the, in the, in the forest area. You could think that it's a kind of big population of wolves and other predators. Looks like they, they found some safety in the forest and they moved to the grass area to, to feed and back to the forest. And <clears throat> it's much, much more complex. No? So what happens with those horses is that they have been uh, doing pretty well in the area <clears throat> up to this 23. Now there are uh, more than uh, 140 individuals in the last time they were counted in 2018. They, they form uh, more than 20 different herds that have been just uh, spreading all over the area. They were released pretty close to uh, Chernobyl city. Uh, they have been just, uh, moving around. Uh, once again, this photo they show uh, five females with four calves, four foals. Uh, the kind of breeding rate is really, really high. And the population again is is growing steadily and and quite fast. They are also adapted pretty well to the hard winter condition in the area. You can see here with kind of this thick winter fur, uh, kind of big uh, big herd of uh, close to ten individuals. <clears throat> Not only this, they have started to, said, to spread and to move around. Uh, they already reach the Belarusian border and cross the Belarusian border, and there are a few herds already established on, on, on Belarus. And they have been also moved through the big Pripia River to the east side of the Pripia River. This is, again, part of a video of our colleague Sergei Gaschak that saw one of the first uh, videos of, of a actually big, big herd of Sevalsky horses on the eastern side of the Pripia River. They closed the river and, and they found sort of a, a new herd 
they, 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 they occupy a new niche in this uh, area of the of the exclusion zone. So once again, it's a species that is 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 growing, is is expanding territories, and is doing pretty pretty well in in the exclusion zone. A species that uh, even if that can surprise many, they you could find it even by the nuclear uh, facility. This is a group uh, just by the um, kind of safe um, safe confinement uh, building that when they were building it, you know, pretty close to the spot where they say radioactive contamination. As I said, they are doing uh, pretty fine over there. You can see kind of big hair just by the electricity towers and by the uh, safe confinement building. So as I said, moving around, even in the rest forest, even just by the by the nuclear uh, facilities. No? <clears throat> as I said, what happens uh, with these species that were released uh, well, almost uh, 12 years after after the accident, is that the population has expanded uh, and multiplied sevenfold, uh, and then moving towards the north and reaching Belarus, moving towards the east and reaches the other side of the of the Pripia River. Again, another example uh, that I really like to stress, together with the wolves, of this kind of massive rewilding that has been happening in Chernobyl over the last uh, three plus decades. No? Uh, it's, it's again and again and again. It's the same story. Whatever the animal you choose, uh, it, it, the animals are not linked to humans or, uh, that have already left the area. But whatever species you choose, are species that are expanding, that are doing well, that maintain really nice peak populations in the area. And, and just to finish, I think uh, it's important to, to try to learn some lessons from here, both in terms of wilding, in nature conservation. And in, the, in terms of, of Chernobyl and radiation, no? I think with all that, that I've been just showing you, uh, there are a few things that are quite clear. I mean, the first one is that the, uh, as I said this uh, here, uh, the mid to long term ecological impact of the Chernobyl accident has been clearly, clearly much, much lower than uh, initially was forecast. Uh, it was expected that area to become a nuclear wasteland. And now it's an area, as I said, it's one of the largest nature reserves in Europe and harbors all kinds of animals you could imagine. Uh, many of those really heavily endangered in other places of, of Europe, you know, birds and wolves and the Sebalski horses and the lynxes and, and, and you name it and, and you have it in, in Chernobyl. So I think it's quite clear an example that uh, even though the, the accident caused uh, kind of big damage at the beginning, especially in humans and Kind of both the uh, physical and psychological psychological damage, the mid to long term impact has been way way lower than uh, a lot of people forecast, and even way way lower than than the, you could uh, listen to a lot of people or, or watch in many documentaries. They're quite scary documentaries, but they are not connected to the reality of the exclusion so. Another, another lesson that we can learn here is that we clearly need more areas with, without human interference. If we want to really have an effective conservation of biodiversity. So Chernobyl is, is for me, this is clear, clear example. As soon as humans left an area, as soon as human activity stop, areas recover, areas rewild, no matter what happens in those areas, even Chernobyl with some radio contaminated environments, the area recovers, the, 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 the trees grow back, uh, the meadows grow, and uh, all animals repopulate the area. So, if we wanted to do effective nature conservation, what we need is to have areas with the smaller human interference possible. It, it doesn't it, it doesn't work if we have these na national parks and nature reserves or whatever, and at the end we use it for touristic uh, uh, or all the kind of, of uh, human activities, because uh, then it doesn't work. We really, we really need areas without as little uh, human activity as possible, if we really want to preserve biodiversity. And the, the third les lesson is a passive rewilding, which is the kind of rewilding that has been happening in Chernobyl mostly, really works. Uh, really works quite quickly, I will say. 
in, in I mean, this is not a situation that is just new. It's been happening <clears throat> over the past many years uh, in, in a really short time, an area like uh, Chernobyl that was just heavily industrial, but also heavily uh, agricultural activity uh, as transforming in a, in a rewilding heaven, uh, as, as the United Nations said. Uh, so passive rewilding works, uh, and it's kind of really uh, cost-effective uh, way of preserving nature and, and kind of recreate functional ecosystems. And I think it's a way that we should explore more and more and more, just to reserve areas for nature, reserve areas for passive rewilding, for conservation, and we will do a really good favor for many of our endangered animals and ecosystems. So, and this is all I have uh, about rewilding in Chernobyl. Uh, I think it was uh, really uh, pleased to talk uh, here to, to replanet uh, Portugal. And I think nice opportunity to show, uh, I always say this, the bright side of Chernobyl. Uh, often Chernobyl and sadly Ukraine lately uh, is always uh, surrounded by darkness and uh, negative comments. And, and I think nature in particular, so the bright side of Chernobyl, the, the positive, the optimistic side in a way, because you have that area uh, and that area is and should be in the future, one of the big, big examples of conservation and biodiversity quality in Europe. And with this, uh, I finish. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Luis, for the invitation. Thanks a lot, uh, Replanet. Thank you so much for this for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, coming from uh, from not not the chat, but also the chat, but from private messages. Mm -hmm. So the first question, I think I can answer myself. Yes, it's Chernobyl with an O. <laughs> it's the yes. Ukrainian. Yeah. Yes, can you please explain? Yeah, Chernobyl with O is is a Ukrainian way of naming the place. Uh, we've been using. Uh, I've been using it a lot. I think most people have been using Chernobyl with an E, which is the Russian name. And I think it's clearly easy to understand why we use the O now, Chernobyl. Ukrainian side, Ukrainian place, Ukrainian name. Thank you. This this just to this was, I think, the most asked question I had so far. But <laughs> we had a couple of other interesting questions. So one of them is, so that you, uh, the professor mentioned there was no human uh, interference. So uh, are there people living in, or were there people living in the area? But if they were, they were probably very reduced in numbers, right? Well, it's, it, it's uh, as I said, the, the area is, is really big. So in the big area, there's almost no people. It's just a, a really, really few, just a handful of really old people living almost alone in, in really a small kind of rural settlements. Uh, there is still, or there used to be before the war, a population of about 1,000, 2,000 people that use the Chernobyl city, you know, the old traditional city in the area, uh, at least from Monday to Thursday, because there were people that are still work in the, in the power plant. So said the commission control, uh, the cleaning of the area. So, but, but they were really, really concentrated into the Chernobyl city. They move in really very little. So, Big, big part of the exclusion zone that is almost empty every single day. So we have a question <laughs> from another replaneteer, which is Thea Tormanen. I hope I said her name well. So has the war done any damage to the area and its species? Uh, it doesn't look like uh, that there's been caused damage to the nature of the area. Uh, actually, Russians started the invasion through Chernobyl. But they were only there, only brackets, uh, only for a month. They they retired from the area. <clears throat> they they retreat from the area. So since um, March uh, last year, the, the area has been uh, kind of outside the, the war in a way. Uh, there is heavy damage on the infrastructure. So I think most of the bridges, if not all of the bridges in the area, uh, they were blown. Uh, either by the Ukrainians when, when they were facing the invasion or by Russians. Uh, many facilities, for example, of the uh, Chernobyl Nature Reserve uh, were just ravaged and sacked and destroyed. Nature, I think, it, it, it has been kind of kept uh, outside of the war. As I said, uh, the area was mostly used as, as a kind of way of passing through 
through through the power plant and, and occupy the power plant and then on their way to to Kiev that they never reach it. Uh, but I think most of the area was left uh, yes untouched. So actually, if any, I will say that there's been even lower human activity in the area over the last year than, than there used to be. Okay. No lot of people walking anymore over there. Mm. Not not tourism over there in, in the last almost three years. So actually, I hope. Yeah. I mean, it's not quite clear, but I hope the area is still as nice as it as it was. Co correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the 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 old nuclear power plant was a tourist attraction. It it was. It's actually really big. I, I mean, the last normal year that was a, a 2019. It was before the. The war, but also before the the, the pandemic, pandemic. Uh, up to one hundred fifty thousand people visited the area. So it's it's an area that is uh, two or three hours from Kiev, uh, the main city in, in Ukraine, the capital, and uh, there, there were a lot of trips, one day or even two day trips uh, from Kiev to to the exclusion zone. Uh, but again, mostly focus on uh, Pripyat, the, the nuclear complex, a uh, few villages on, on the way. And the rest of the area was not really affected by tourism. Actually, it was, I think, if done with, with good controls, it was a good way of both preserving the, so the legacy of the accident of the people that used to be there and a good sort of way of, of uh, receiving in, uh, money and income, uh, people in the area uh, and preserving at the same time the nature in, in, the, in, the, in the zone. So now we have, I think, a couple of questions I think we can bundle together. So it's from Paul Clavel. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I'm sorry. So is the radioactivity having any reported negative impacts in animal health or life expectancy? And I think we can merge this with Adam Blazowski's question, which is, can you comment about the frogs and the effect of the radiation? Mm -hmm. The frogs were, were coming up. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, first with the first question. I mean, <coughs> it's it's always uh, there is any effect. I mean, there is always some effect, but it's uh, individual effects. I mean, the first thing that, that uh, is important to realize is that the radiation levels have dropped more than 90% in the area. And actually, uh, the most risky isotopes have disappeared. So, I, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people know about the kind of iodine and iodine pills and these kind of things. So the, the radioactive iodine, that, that is the most dangerous uh, of the isotopes that were generated in the accident, they have a really, really, really short life. So iodine-131 already disappeared from Chernobyl, uh, summer 1986. So what, what we have now is... is uh, uh, even the half of the amount of cesium and strontium that is uh, distributed in really kind of a spotted way. So we have areas that uh, you could just go with your dosimeters and you put it uh, uh, in a particular place and it is high radiation area uh, point uh, and you move it 50 centimeters and it drops two orders of magnitude. So it's, it's a quite complex environment in terms of radiation. Overall, at population levels, uh, there is no effects. Uh, it's important to, to, to keep in mind that the, if, you, if you work on, on the area, you need to consider the effects of the human absence. So you are working with a species that are kind of linked to humans, um, sparrows, um, barn swallows, uh, that are actually doing poorly. They're not doing poorly because there is radiation, doing poorly because there are no humans and there are no farmlands they depend on. Uh, so that's quite important, and this has not always been considered. Uh, apart from that, uh, as I said, at population levels, there is nothing that you could really uh, pick up. Uh, at individual levels, there is always some individual that you could find with uh, some things, uh, but uh, it's always difficult to say it. it's because of radiation, because those things happen uh, regularly. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's not quite clear. As I said, overall, nature in the, in the area is thriving, as I would say, that, like in almost no other place in Europe. Uh, and now with, with the frogs, uh, because uh, most of my research uh, has been conducted there with, with frogs, and in particular with three frogs. Uh, one thing that we found uh, that is quite, I think, quite relevant is 
He said, well, we, the, the first thing we find is that there are frogs everywhere, the same as horses and other animals. Uh, the, the frogs look normal in a way. There are no three eyes or five legs or anything like that. And when we look at many parameters from, as you said, age or, or uh, physiological parameters, uh, damage to liver, uh, kidney, uh, immune systems or whatever, we don't find anything. So frogs are doing fine. And at physiological level and morphological level, they are doing fine. Uh, what we find is that uh, the coloration of those frogs is different in Chernobyl than in, in areas outside. So those frogs are much, much darker than the regular frogs in other places and the regular frogs in other places in, in Ukraine. And, and actually, uh, we work with a, with a species that is green, kind of brilliant green, and we could find even pure black frogs in Chernobyl. And that's quite important, quite, quite relevant, because what, what it's telling us is, uh, is about the role of melanin in radi radiation protection. And we know from other uh, groups of organisms like fungi that uh, melanin, uh, the same as melanin protects our skin, our, our bodies from UV radiation from the sun. Melanin also has a protective role against ionizing radiation, the kind of radiation that you find in Chernobyl. Uh, so, so this is what uh, we propose that is happening in our frogs. So this uh, uh, melanin is protecting frogs. And actually the, the cool thing is that it's not connected with the level of radiation that our frogs experience, but it's connected with the levels of radiation that those areas experience at the time of the accident. So what, what we are seeing now mm. is not an effect of radiation now, but radiation from the past. It has been inherited uh, and selected through, through many uh, different uh, generations, 10, 12, 15 generations in the species. And has been in a way fixed in the species because as I said, in a radioactive environment, uh, at the time of the accident, it was an advantage, and it looks like it's not a big cost to produce for the frogs. So it's, it's kept on the, at least for now, on the on the species in Chernobyl. Quite cool because it's a good example of, as I said, the, the protective role of melanin in radio, uh, kind of in radio protection that could be uh, could be used, for example, on on the space exploration. But at the same time, it's, it's a really cool example of evolution in, in action, no? evolution in real time, which is in, really, really nice. In a quick time scale. Mm -hmm. So so a, a final question, because we have hit the hour mark. So uh, has the area been designed with an official status as a protected area or as a nature reserve? Mm -hmm. Both both the Belarusian side and the Ukrainian side are both nature reserves. Uh, I mean, it's, Belarusian is quite particular uh, <laughs> country in many ways, but... Uh, the Ukrainian side, actually, uh, even now, even in the middle of the war, a uh, big uh, part of the of the handle of, of the exclusion zone has been transpassed to the nature reserve. So actually, the uh, the Chernobyl uh, nature reserve has been granted kind of the uh, legal status of uh, organizations responsible for the for the exclusion zone, and it's uh, it's not quite clear what 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 would be exactly the future of the entire exclusion zone, but uh, I'm pretty sure big, big, big part of the area will be devoted for nature and nature conservation. So uh, if there, is no, there are no questions from the audience, I would like to thank the professor again. It was an amazing presentation. Uh, no, thank you. We, we should, you should see our chat, our internal chat right now. It's, it's very, <laughs> people are excited about the, mm -hmm. the slide. Uh, Again, I, we cannot thank you enough to sell it. This is this was a perfect way to celebrate World Rewilding Day with the lessons from from Chernobyl, and let's hope we can bring those lessons to other places in the in the in the world, in the entire world. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope we I hope we talk again soon. Oh, and uh, and and thanks thanks again. And uh, to the audience, thank you for watching. Uh, we are Replanet, liberate uh, nature, elevate humanity. Thank you, thank you very much for watching. Okay, thank you. And we're done. Okay. okay.